place that we needed to influence was actually the, um, the OS vendors because uh, as uh, um, uh, Jim Pinkerton said when he stood on the stage a couple of years ago, he, he stated that you know Microsoft announces he, with a big emphasis that we're joining this and we're not joining it to, to observe, we're joining it to lead. He says, because this redefines how operating systems will be built in the future. That was uh, as close to a direct quote from Jim as I, I could have. Uh, Microsoft um, and the Linux community have been incredible partners in making this thing going. Um, uh, quite frankly, it wouldn't happen without their help. So uh, this is probably the single most important part of, of, of the talk. So Neil, the stage is yours. You still have half hour. If, yep. Give me a five minute warning. And yeah, I'll give you a five minute warning. We need. We, Where's the run button? It's, it's great, but yeah. you have yeah. Where's the run button when you need it? Yeah. I'm not. Well, so it's, no, it's under view. It's under view. Yeah, full screen. Oh, there we go. Ah, there we go. Thank you. Uh, my name's Neil Christensen. I um, work in the storage, uh, storage and file systems team at Microsoft. See if I can figure out how to advance this. Ah, okay. So basically, we've talked a lot about storage class memory today. I don't need to go into a lot of extra detail. Um, I just wanted to give some of the terms. There's lots of different terms for it. The term that we've been using is storage class memory. I know that some companies are using persistent memory. Maybe one of these days we'll agree on a term for this stuff. Um, the first thing I want to say is storage class memory is a disruptive technology. It's been up, brought up multiple times today. Customers want the fastest performance. An important concept, and it has also been raised, system software. The operating system gets in the way of performance. And then also customers want application compatibility. And these are really conflicting goals that we need to figure out how we can solve. Uh, the goals that Microsoft has for storage class memory is that we do want to provide a mechanism for zero copy access, access to the persistent memory, but we still want most existing user mode applications to run without modification. And, and in addition to that, we also want a 100% backward compatibility mode uh, because there is this huge investment in software that exists out there. And uh, which means we, you know, the failure modes are a little different, so there's a little ad adaptation that needs to go to go on. And what's really important is the storage class memory is byte granular. And we have decades of software that understands the concept of a sector. And so we need to provide a way to give sector granular failure, failure modes for this, again, for app compatibility. Um, so what we're doing is in the Windows environment, we're actually introducing a new type of volume, what we call the direct access storage volume. And basically our mechanism for accessing this is memory map files, which will provide applications with direct access to the underlying byte addressable storage class memory. And this is to maximize performance, gets the OS out of the way. Um, in the Windows environment, this DAS mode volume is chosen at format time. So when you format a volume, uh, that resides on storage class memory. You choose if you want to run it in this new mode, this new class of storage at the time of format. And there is some functionality that is lost in the system because of that, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. And in the Windows environment, we are supporting both the NTFS and the REFS file systems with this. Now, this new type of memory does require a new driver model. There is a storage class memory bus driver as well as a disk driver. Uh, the purpose of the bus driver is to basically do all the management of it, and it's not in the I.O. path. The disk driver is. Uh, it is a, a general driver for logical SCM devices. This is 
the drivers can be hardware specific. Uh, we're focused, uh, we did have a version of the driver that was for DDR3. Uh, the current version of the driver is for DDR4 that we're working on today. One of the things that we decided, and I'll talk a little bit about why later, is that we will make this look as a native 4K sector de device. And there's performance reasons and there's uh, space utilization reasons for doing this. And this new driver does introduce new management interfaces because uh, there's new and unique failure modes that, again, I'll bring up later. So basically, this, the model that we're using is a memory, doing memory mapped I.O. in DAS mode. Again, it is chosen at format time. And what we're doing is we're mapping. When you create a memory map file, we're going to map you directly to the direct attached storage, to the persistent memory. Uh, we have not changed any of the existing APIs to do this. So an application that uses memory mapping today can continue to run on this environment and run without change. Now how this actually works is the memory manager asks the file system at section creation time if it can be created in traditional mode or a new DAS mode. And the file system will return yes when the volume resides on SEM hardware and, and the volume has been formatted for byte addressable mode. Now, when a section is created in DAS mode, MM asks the file system to do the, physical uh, to do the physical memory ranges for a given range of the file. So what there is, is there's this file. And some comments were brought up earlier today. The reason you want file systems to continue to manage the storage class memory is because there's lots of, a file is a nice unit of management. It can be copied, it can be moved elsewhere. Uh, we have security around files. We have lots of uh, decades of, of experience in security. So tracking and managing storage class memory with a file system and with files has lots of advantages. And so as we do this, as we have this uh, DAS mode mem section created, MM asks the file system to translate a range. The file system takes a, a given range of a file and converts it into a volume relative extents. That is sent down to our underlying storage driver, which then translates that to the physical addresses that are required, and we return that up. Oops, did that too soon. Oh, I popped out. Thank you. Um, and then once it gets those physical addresses, the memory manager simply uh, creates its mapping tables, pointing that directly at the underlying storage. What we call this is true zero copy access resort to storage. And one of the important things that you give up in doing this is you give up paging IOs. And, um, and that's one of the important hook points that operating systems have, that file systems have for doing some of the work that they do. But again, those are overhead, so we're eliminating the overhead by giving them direct access. Now, what we've done for cached I.O. In general, file systems provide three different I.O. models. They can have memory mapped I.O., cached I.O., and non-cached I.O. In the cached I.O. case, you're still going through your normal read and write APIs as you open your file for cache mode. But what we're doing to improve the performance of cached I.O. in a direct access mode volume is the, is the cache manager will create its mappings directly to the underlying storage using the same APIs that the memory map files use. And basically, the cache manager will cop directly from the user's buffer into the persistent memory. And so we call this one, one copy access to the persistent storage. So you do see there is a performance boost even for cached I.O. if you want to keep your, uh, do not want to modify your application. And again, as in memory mapped I.O., there's no paging reads or paging writes that are generated. And in fact, you don't need a latency writer out of the cache manager because there's nothing to lazily write. Uh, Non-cached I.O., there's been much debate internally on this. Today, uh, we are sending non-cached I.O.s down, to the, down the storage stack to the SCM storage driver. There is performance overhead of this. We have discussed switching it to cache mode. One of the reasons for keeping it in this mode for right now is because it maintains some of the failure semantics that applications, uh, various components, want to, want to realize and understand. If you, they want to know uh, if the hardware is failing underneath. And if you go through cached I.O., which is in, inherently asynchronous, uh, it eliminates some of those paths. 
So this is one we are still debating the best way to handle. OK, so file system metadata in DAS mode. So the file system metadata will, at least in, in the NTFS file system, will not use uh, direct access sec sections. And the reason for this is because it's a, it's a write ahead logging system, and we need to maintain write order for our logging to work properly. So for now, all of our reads and writes go down to the storage stack for the metadata quite small relative to the amount of user data, so we don't think it'll be a uh, very visible overhead. And in the future, we're looking at how we can change at least some of our metadata files to leverage uh, the storage class memory and make them faster and more efficient. Now, as I said, persistent memory eliminates some of the traditional hook points that various uh, pieces of software need to perform their task. And so this is a list of functionality uh, that is lost when you are in a volume that is allowing direct memory mapping uh, by an application. For example, and I won't go through all these, but uh, NTFS has built-in software encryption. We can't do that anymore because when it's memory mapped, we have no ability to, do the in to encrypt or decrypt. You can't do compression. And this, these are all software, software encryption. We can't do uh, software compression, again, for the same reason. We have no hook port. Uh, TXF is a transactional file system semantics that we've built into NTFS. We're missing some of our hook points. Uh, we have a, uh, the USN journal uh, has, has a feature, which is a change journal in the system to track ranges. Again, doesn't work for memory map files. Um, and then some of the new features of REFS, uh, the block cloning one is a very nice support where it basically it's kind of a built-in dedupe concept. They can't do it because when you memory map it, you have no ability to realize that it's uh, changing so to, to split the block cloning to do that copy on write. So there is a lot of function on that functionality that is lost, and uh, that is, has, application, has impact on applications that are dependent on some of these services. Um, uh, one of the interesting challenges we've also had is that when you, even when you create a memory map section, there's some things you don't know and understand anymore. As an example, uh, it's hard to tell when a file is modified or that its access time has changed because uh, you, you don't see any rights to it. Uh, our change journal, it's hard to know that a file has been changed. And also, uh, Windows has a concept called directory change notification. So we can uh, inform applications when a, a file in a given directory is changed or in a directory hierarchy. So what we're doing for these things uh, at this time is we are updating them when a section is created. Not the most ideal solution, but it's the cleanest solution at this time that we can come up with. These are areas that we hope to improve on in the, in the future. Um, now let's come back to, so I talked about we're creating a new type of volume called a, what we call a direct access mode volume, a DAS volume. For 100% back, for backwards compatibility, we're also supporting what we call a block mode volume. Uh, it maintains all the existing storage semantics. It's what's it's been talked about a lot earlier in the day where you traverse down, it, it behaves like a normal disk drive today. There's just a different driver at the bottom. All the other semantics are identical. Um, we have done work to shorten that path. And I have a, a little slide to talk about that. There's no uh, store port or mini port drivers because they introduce too much lace latency. And we've also, inside of Windows, we do this, trans we translate everything to SCSI and then to the, then the driver trans uh, transform, it, transform it to what's underneath. We've limited, eliminated all of those transformations as well. So again, this is fully compatible, supported by all file systems, works with existing uh, file system and storage filters. And again, to reiterate, in our environment, block mode versus DAS mode is chosen at format time. Uh, there is, uh, what we are introducing for these direct access mode volumes is a new volume device class as well. And one of the reasons for this is again, in the Windows environment, there's filters at various layers. That, uh, you can filter above the file system, you can filter uh, at the volume stack level. In the volume stack, you can also filter in the storage stack. And one of the reasons for introducing this new class is to eliminate uh, compatibility issues with both some of our uh, volume filters as well as third-party volume filters. 
Uh, one of the things we've been concerned about, uh, a volume filter being an example, is, is there's Vol Snap, which is, does our volume snapshotting features, BitLocker, uh, which is our software encryption engine. It, removing these from the stack as well as third-party filters. And by creating this new class of stack, none of these guys will, will touch into these environments automatically. Uh, the, the software has to be revved so that it can uh, access these, which means they've made the changes to understand it properly. And this is important so we don't get drivers in there. Someone creates these things, there's some encryption driver down at the volume level, and he just starts corrupting your data when you start memory mapping it. it you just see corrupt data. And this is one of our, this, these are some of the solutions we're, we're doing to solve these problems. Uh, this is an IOSTAT comparison. I don't know which one of these things. Let's see. Where's the pointer? Very top. Oh, very top. There we go. Um, you can see this inside of a Windows system, this is a typical environment, various drivers in the stack. You can see there's many ports and store port and class DNP and our volume manager. Or snapshotting. I, I left BitLocker out. BitLocker is also in this stack, and and so there's all these drivers. You know, we've talked a lot about today. In a in a storage class memory block mode volume, we have some of these top things, but we've eliminated a lot of the lower stuff again just to speed it up. And then when we have a direct access mode volume, the app can talk directly to it if it's memory mapped. For cached I/O, it goes into the file system. The file system talks directly which talks to the cache manager, which directly, basically, cached I.O. goes directly to it, eliminating all this stuff. And today, if you do non-cached I.O., you come down this thing through the, through the stack. We are working to eliminate these software overheads. You know, we've written, we've written drivers and stuff over, you know, again, decades, because we know, you know, an I.O. takes forever. It doesn't matter how efficient this driver is. Um, Flash helped us to start down the road of, of improving performance and we've done a lot of work to improve performance since the introduction of flash this is just another one how do we improve performance even more of these drivers oh popped out again i guess i keep hitting the wrong button so another layer that we have so i talked about how we're solving compatibility problems at the volume dry, uh, volume filter level we also have what is known as file system filters, and they lay above the file system. What they do is they can see all of the interactions coming into and out of the file system. Uh, these are examples of various types of, of filters that exist. Um, what we're doing to eliminate compatibility issues with this is that no existing filters will be notified when a DAS, DAS mode volume is mounted. And what we're introducing is a new registration time flag that says, hey, I understand this concept, and uh, you, can, you can tell me about these things. There are compatibility issues with filters, and it all stems from the fact that they don't get any paging I.O. Data transformation filters, example is encryption and compression, there's just no hook point to do their work. They can't do it at a software level because they don't see things changing because of the direct access mode. Antivirus filters, uh, they're actually surprisingly minimally impact, and that's because they really don't filter on read and write. They filter at open and close. That's when they detect uh, viruses on a system. Uh, they are making, they do have to make tweaks uh, to detect when a file is modified because those rules have changed a little bit. But other than that, they're pretty un unimpacted. Another class of filter that's kind of in the middle is replication filters. It's difficult to, for them to detect exactly when a file is changed and what those changes are, unlike how it used to be. And so there's some efficiency issues there. Now, let me talk about sector atomicity. Um, as I said earlier, we have software that for years has realized that there are sectors underneath and failure modes are in chunks, you know, 512 bytes, whatever it is, sectors. Um, in, in, both, in the NTFS file system, it has ways to detect torn writes, but it's sector granular, it's not subsector granular, and so it, it has a hard time. So there is this algorithm developed by Intel, in fact, it, it's specifically Andy Rudolph over here, uh, it's called uh, BTT, it's the BTT, which is a block translation table, 
It's an efficient sector level atomicity. It, it provides efficient sector level atomicity of rights and eliminates subsector torn rights. On power loss, you either see the old contents or the new contents, but you don't see a, a break between them. And as, in all, as we all understand in software, you just add a level of indirection and you can solve all problems, right? And so uh, basically, it's a translation table that's just page swapping at, at, a, at a sector level. You're doing sector level uh, page swapping. And one of the reasons we're going with the native 4K sector size is to eliminate the overhead, to minimize the overhead of the, of the BTT on a volume because basically you need a table entry for every sector on the device so you, that you can, uh, can swap it. Now, it uses a small portion of, this, of the storage class memory space for its mapping tables and control structures. And it is not visible. It's actually completely hidden by the driver. You just see a little, teeny, a little bit smaller driver. Um, and at least for Windows, what we're doing is we're not providing an option to not support VTT. It's one of the things we've considered for the future, but for now, uh, the control structures are always there. Now, how we're managing it is the file system tells the storage driver if a given block should use BTT. We do this at a, basically at an IO, granu IO granularity. We've actually added a new per IO flag to indicate if the given LBA may be remapped or not. And um, the reason for this is, well, let me talk about the usage and then I'll talk a little bit about the reason. The reason for this is that, uh, so block mode volume, so if you're running in block mode, it's, which is our compatibility mode, every LBA will always be remapped using BTT, so block mode is fully compatible with uh, sector atomicity guarantees. For NTFS DAS mode volumes, so in direct access mode, the file system metadata rights may be remapped, again because NTFS doesn't have good infrastructure for detecting subsector torn rights. And because we want to maintain backward comp compatibility with down level ver versions of Windows, we want to maintain that. And so uh, we require, we, we allow BTT usage for metadata, but not for, de for data. And the REFS file system, which is relatively new, and it actually uh, checksums all of its metadata, it can actually detect subsector torn rights and deal with them appropriately. So it can just, uh, it always says, do not use BTT. Uh, again, for a DAS mode volume. The, seven oh, seven minutes, thank you. Good, we're almost done. Um, there was something I wanted to add there, but I don't remember, so it'll come to me in a minute. So the, we use the BTT expense extensively. We've been working with Intel to make it very optimal. It has surprisingly little overhead uh, in its usage, so we've done a, it's, we've worked with them to do a good job of making it very performant. So let's talk about applications for a minute. Um, applications, there's a lot of software out there, and a lot of people, you know, there's been a lot of good discussion earlier today about soft uh, applications needing to change or not needing to change or whatever it is. Um, our model, our goal was to make it so in block mode, everything's compatible. Everything works as it always does. Even in DAS mode, most applications will run without modification. It's pretty transparent to them. And you really only, and I agree with this model that, you know, the SQLs, the database engines of the world, those are the guys that are gonna probably change first to really le leverage this because they care about performance more than anything else. But um, a lot of applications won't change. And that's why we've maintained a, a, a consistent model. Now, it was brought up earlier about this Intel NVML library. Uh, we are, this is an open source library implemented by Intel, also driven by Andy Rudolph, and so we appreciate his work in this area. Um, it defines a set of application APIs for efficient use of storage class memory hardware. It kind of abstracts out the OS specific dependencies. It is, it does rely on the, op, on the file system supporting direct access memory uh, in the mode that we're doing. And we are working to port this library. Uh, we're working with Intel to port this library to the Windows environment. It is an open source GitHub thing, and there's some links there that have been on other slides as well. Um, it's actually a very exciting library. If you think about it, an application 
They have to deal with all the failure modes if they're just going to create a memory map file and talk to it directly. And there is a lot of failure modes that can happen and they have to deal with that. Hey, I wrote this byte and I didn't write this byte and I got to recover from it. What's nice about the libraries is they do, there is a little bit of overhead introduced with them, but it simplifies the work drastically uh, that the application has to do. Uh, these are just some of the different areas and again a link to it of the NVML library. And uh, in conclusion, I think SEM is a very exciting new technology. Uh, I've been working in the storage and file systems area for about 30 years. The innovations just don't stop. It's very exciting to see what's coming down the line. Remember, it is a disruptive technology. There are performance trade-offs uh, with and without application modification. And the operating system is in the way of most of you getting your work done, and so we're going to provide a model to, to uh, eliminate that barrier to performance. We're going to put it on the app. If it's slow, blame the app. Don't blame the OS anymore. <laughs>